Okay, so the first thing I want to consider or look at is just maybe you guys can introduce yourselves a little bit to the panel. Um, our panel, introduce yourselves to our, uh, our, our group here this morning. Uh, maybe Todd, we'll just start with you and kind of go on down the line. If you guys just tell us a little bit about yourselves and your career and uh, uh, how you've gotten to where you are. Good morning. Thank you so much to Phil and to Rob for the privilege to be here um, with you this morning. Uh, my name is Todd Carlisle, and I'm an attorney at Sorority and Permit. I spent seven years here on this campus um, you know, as an undergraduate and then I was in law school um, and then um, been with the Sorority firm for <clears throat> all of my career except eight years at that time I was a client. Uh, the most important thing I took off this campus is my wife, Karen, um, and uh, we're very, very, uh, very grateful. Uh, we've been married about, almost be 28 years this year, and we have three children. One is a Sanford graduate in nursing, another is a <clears throat> about to be a senior in math, and a freshman who will be um, a pre-business major in worship and music minor who will uh, be starting here in, in one month. So we're about to be empty nesters, so that's the most nervous thing going on in our life right now is what that transition looks like. So. Hi, well, good morning. I'm Jeff Dunn. Currently, I uh, head the Alabama Department of Corrections. Um, I, too, have a strong connection with Sanford. I left the campus in 86 uh, and entered the United States Air Force. And uh, I, much like you, probably the best thing that I left with from Sanford was my wife, Susan. Uh, and um, so 28 and a half years in the United States Air Force. I'm a pilot by trade. And then by just... Uh, interesting twist of uh, God's redirection in our life. Uh, about two and a half years ago, the uh, governor uh, appointed me to this current position. Um, I do want to just uh, give one quick shout out. I've got two children, uh, both grown out of the house, uh, and my son Shaw is uh, here with us today. Uh, he's uh, in full-time Alabama Air National Guard, and then I have a daughter who's a teacher in Greensboro, North Carolina. And so I look forward to being with you all this morning. Good morning. My name is Ricky Moore. Uh, I do have ties with Sanford. I'm a graduate here. Uh, I play football and basketball here. Uh, well, um, I have a, a son and a daughter, uh, uh, which two of my wife we adopted. I've um, been with Express Oil Train for 20 years. I have a lovely wife for 20 years as well. Um, uh, the, the best thing that I think I can top these guys that I left with Sanford. We're here at Sanford. Uh, I was led to Christ. Hmm. That's the best thing here. Amen. Well, gentlemen, um, this next question is just kind of a, a short one for all of you, but in this conversation about grace and truth, just so people kind of know where you're coming from, if you could just sort of briefly talk about um, which side. Which side do you tend to err on, you know, in terms of natural default? Hopefully we're all sort of working towards a balance. Uh, but where, where is your sort of most comfortable space? Are you more grace-oriented in your conversation, or are you more truth-driven in, in the way you, you speak with people? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's a difficult question. You probably could ask my son uh, and get a, a more accurate answer. Um, or there's some folks, that, uh, colleagues that I work with here that may give you an answer, but I, I know what I perceive myself to be, and that is I actually feel like I trend on the grace side. I tend to not want to be confrontational. But unfortunately, uh, in the business I'm in and my profession, my whole professional life, that really was never an option. But I think over the years, I kind of came to the conclusion that that, that may be a false dichotomy. And what I mean by that is um, the question is, in my mind, not grace or truth, but the question is, what sh how do you feel about the person that you've got to communicate with? If you really love them, then you're going to speak truth into their life and they will and they should know that you love them. And so um, I, as I've gotten older, I've thought, tried more to think in terms of am I being gracious? Am I being truthful? But what does love demand? Sometimes love demands just a shoulder to cry on and not a direct, you know, hard truth. But sometimes love demands a very hard truth in a very direct manner. Um, and so uh, I don't know that I'm there yet, uh, but I, I really am trying to rethink this whole balance between grace and truth uh, to think about, well, what does love demand in this situation? Because it's different every time, I think. Uh, and there's no one answer uh, that applies in every situation. Ricky. 
Uh, I think I tend to uh, on the grace a uh, great side too. Uh, when you're dealing with the customer, you know the you have your customer complaints. Um, no one want to have a, a customer who's uh, something did wrong. You want to be uh, true with them, but I so you'll have that grace as well. Uh, dealing with that is is really hard, uh, but at the end, you know, I, I get it across. You know, with with the main grace to it. I think people who know me. Um, if they really knew my heart, I'm probably much more on the truth side, meaning that um, I don't mind having to deal with confrontation, having to deal with a heart issue, having to communicate something through something uh, in the flesh. That's probably my orientation. So I could be uh, in my flesh. If I'm not careful, I can be really direct, too direct. Um, when I was in college, some uh, folks pointed me to the uh, passage in Matthew 28 about uh, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Uh, baptizing them in the name, name of the Holy Sp- uh, the Holy Spirit, um, and I think I just messed that up. But <laughs> baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Uh, and the the basic idea of grounding my life in discipleship is where I really caught a passion for when I was in college. And so that means that for me, I think the dichotomy comes together. And I agree with Jeff that the, you have to. I don't really think of it as grace and truth. I think about whether the communication I'm having is shepherding or discipling the person that I'm dealing with. If they're uh, not a believer, I want to evangelize them in my approach to them. If they are a believer, I want to make sure I'm moving them forward spiritually in the way I'm dealing with them. And that sometimes does take direct communication. I'm not much of a beat around the bush kind of person. Uh, but the framing of that for me has been through that perspective. And I've tried to carry that into every sphere of my life so that I just have one simple principle I live by and giving my life away and discipling or shepherding and all of my communication I try to frame around that I certainly mess up a lot and I have to go back and apologize when I'm too direct that's that is the one apology I've probably given more, more times than I'd like to and hopefully I will give it less as I you hopefully you mature to the point where you stop doing it as often but I still in the flesh that would be my failure be on the truth side so um, Ricky uh, next question is for you just thinking about your environment, you know, when, when I thought about having you on the panel, I just realized that some of the most challenging uh, customer interactions happen in retail environments. And so just thinking about the fact that with your job, you have to deliver uh, bad news to people in terms of your car has got some major problem with it or uh, just working with uh, employees who are, you know, hourly wage employees and um, this may not be their lifetime dream job. Just, I'd love to hear kind of how you address those kinds of difficult situations in your environment, uh, you know, with this concept of grace and truth. How do you find that balance? Really, uh, when you're dealing with customers, my, my business, you have to be truthful to them, uh, uh, direct, and try to, like, sometimes, you know, customers, they don't have the money to fix it so but we do offer other things like credit cards the express oil chain but training the employees to do the same thing but like he said that's not their likelihood but you want to make sure you tell the truth uh, right now I'm in a situation where one of the employees did tell the customer uh, the truth not the truth uh, and it's going to come back and bite us hard and so it's going to and so um, a customer you know, like that or been a uh, customer by 15 years um, express on chain turning and works on integrity. We have core values, mission statement. You want to be truthful, especially in the uh, automobile industry, because people will take advantage of you, especially women. Um, but to try to train the employees, you know, to tell the truth and don't recommend or sell something that a customer don't need, because if you do, you know, it's just consequences. But uh, I try to train employees to tell the truth and and just. Do the right thing because of our core values. Very good. Well, thank you, Ricky. Um, thinking about Todd, just your situation, you know, you're responsible for shepherding 120 lawyers. That just frankly sounds a little terrifying to me. Uh, with, uh, with all of their able opinions and uh, strong feelings about things, you probably have more truth driven people in your. Uh, employed than, than most. So I'd love to hear kind of how, uh, just as you shared a little bit about your background, how you've navigated that kind of environment uh, and, and lead, lead those kinds of uh, folks. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I, I think that when you work in the in any workplace, and mine mine has its own uniquenesses. Um, from that standpoint, of that, I have a, I'm the dumbest person in the building. Um, to everybody, everybody smarter than me um, that I that I uh, that I um, serve. And I think the first principle for me is I have to view myself as serving them and not leading them um, in that way. Uh, number two, when I approach them, I have to be honest whenever I communicate. But honesty doesn't take a harsh tone. I can communicate. I try to smile. Try to make sure that the uh, love of Christ is coming out whenever I'm communicating, uh, whatever I'm communicating. Um, I have to remember who I am as in, in Christ and make sure I communicate from that standpoint. Um, I have to not engage the battle. I think that's a really hard thing in any type of communication. Mm-hmm. If somebody comes in and confronts you, um, I spent my first two years at Sanford on the debate team here, and all we did was engage the battle with each other, you know, morning, noon, and night as friends and. Um, and that, you know, I, I realized there's some verses that I was sort of studying through Second Timothy that, you know, foolish and ignorant speculation was condemned by Paul in his letter to Timothy. And I learned that, you know, in my, in my job today, don't engage every battle. You know, there are places where if somebody disagrees over something, it's okay not to, um, not to kind of ramrod over them. And that, again, that's, that's probably, um, I, I'm impatient uh, and I am, um, three steps ahead sometimes, and sometimes I need to stop, slow down, not be impatient, and listen more. And I think those weaknesses, I have to be really self-aware of your weaknesses. So that's my confession. <laughs> You're my priest here today. So not really, that's a joke. <laughs> well, Jeff, you've had two careers. Um, just thinking about you know your background with the military and working in sort of a unique organization there, and then now transitioning in the last couple of years to the Department of Corrections and working with government and just the layers of of politics and and challenges uh, that are maybe a little uh, nuanced and different, particularly heading an organization as as you've uh, been tasked with. So I would love to just kind of hear your thoughts about how you've had to navigate and interact and you know, going back to what you earlier said, you know, this idea of grace and truth, they're really not two things, that they're one thing in terms of what does the situation call for. I'd love to kind of hear sort of what the differences have been for you and how you apply that. Yeah, um, I, just a couple things. One, uh, I was a whole lot smarter when I was younger. I can promise <laughs> you that. Uh, the, the older I get, the, the dumber I get, I feel like. Um, but the, the, the one thing, particularly in this current position, that I have, have kind of gleaned is that uh, I was a very poor listener. And oftentimes, uh, my communication with folks, this is a little bit of, of a confession, um, it was, I wasn't really listening. I was just formulating my response while the other person's mouth was moving. Um, and that that led to to more problems because as I've as I've tried to mature in that area, first of all, you realize that 80 percent of communication is nonverbal and it's only 20 percent of, of actual communication is what what we say. And so when I tried to go from and it's really an issue of pride, gentlemen, that what I have to say is more important. So if you'll just get done with what you're saying and then let me talk, we'll solve this issue. Because I really know the answer. When I moved off of that and thought, okay, uh, regardless of how this person is delivering this message, there may be some truth in here that I need to pay pay very close attention to. And what I realized is that I was a master at jumping to conclusions, at uh, not listening for all the facts, not trying to understand where the person was coming from, all of those types of things doesn't suggest that I have to change my position or change my course of action. But as I've tried to do that, uh, I, I have found that I, I tend to be a little bit more circumspect when I speak. Thus says the colonel. Thus says the commissioner. Um, and so uh, that, that's probably the most significant thing. And I think the scripture really speaks to that. It, it really does challenge, in particular, men with rash words. And, and being quick to speak, uh, those types of things. And so um, it's been particularly true in my current job because if, if you don't listen and pay attention, you, you will miss the nuances of what's going on. And 
you'll make bad decisions, and the consequences, at least for me, those decisions are significant. And so I, I guess the, the overall point of this is that um, develop the skill of active listening and, and take the time. And it's hard because you have to concentrate. And, and I don't have a very long attention span. Um, and it, as I have told my son and my wife, it sucks the life out of me. Um, but it's, it's hard work. Uh, but it's very important uh, in my judgment. And so th- that would probably be the first thing uh, I would go to is just listen first. Doesn't mean you have to change, but just listen uh, actively as to what the person is saying. Todd, you, uh, you sort of made the uh, comment, uh, personal confession time. Well, this would be the opportunity for it. Has there ever, uh, uh, this for all of you guys, uh, has there ever been an opportunity or a situation looking back on it now um, that you wish you would have been more gracious, that you think that the outcome or the person would have been more significantly helped if you guys had been more gracious and uh, you know, share, share that with this idea that you know, we all learn from, from one another, even from our failures. <laughs> I mean, okay. Um, well, I, I think... Um, Certainly, uh, as a parent, I could go down a whole litany uh, where I could have my very kind son plead that he stay silent during this portion. Um, but, uh, you know, so I think about that. Um, the, the, I think probably the situation that, that comes to mind the most is um, very recently uh, we had a pretty major personnel decision that we had to make uh, in the department. And uh, the person who uh, normally would have made that decision uh, made what I consider to be the wrong decision. Um, And I I had to step in, which I am reluctant to do at times because I I believe in delegating decisions as to the lowest level possible. But in this case, in my judgment, it was just the wrong decision for the organization. And so I stepped in. I, I prefer to do things via consensus. So I brought him in. I got him to explain why he was making this decision he was making, give me all the reasons and the rationale. Uh, I, I, I tried to plant some seeds. Of, hey, go back and just rethink this. I don't think that's kind of in concert with the vision and where we're going. And, and he did. He came back. He was still entrenched. Um, and instead of being gracious and continuing that conversation and being patient with him, I basically had to say, hey, <clears throat> sorry. I'm pulling rank on you. This is what we're doing. Um, and that was, that was just the wrong thing to do. Um, I, I, it wasn't respectful. Uh, it didn't <coughs> acknowledge the, the fact that he had the best interest of the organization at, at heart, and he thought he was genuinely doing what was best for the organization. Um, and I shouldn't have done that, and I had to go back to him and say, hey, let's, let's try to start this process back over again, and let me show you why I think this person is a better fit for where we're going as an organization. We patched it up. We came around. It ended up being one of those very difficult conversations that, thankfully, the Lord enabled the relationship to be strengthened. But initially, we had to go through something that we really shouldn't have had. But but it was because of my need to, quote, establish who's in charge um, at a time when I really didn't need to do that. My, My authority was not being threatened. I just thought it was being threatened. And so it was really somewhat immature on my part. Uh, but thankfully, uh, we worked it out, and, and I'm thankful that uh, it, uh, it did work out. So. Thank you, Jim. Somebody else want to share? I think the most, um, the most frequent times when I've had that happen to me in the past, and you know, in the past few weeks even, if I let myself go into a setting where I haven't... Um, been grounding myself well in God's word and I'm not getting enough rest and I'm moving in on my agenda and somebody gets in the way of that, you know, in a a recent situation that would happen and, you know, I might plow over that person um, because they didn't, you know, quote, get it in my perspective. And, you know, when I did that last and I had to go back and say, I'm sorry, uh, in my work context, I'm not a not a client confrontation, um, but in a work context, um, it was 
you know, it's good for me to have to do that because it reminds me. I, I do, I have in my life tried to build in the practice of when I've done that to go back and apologize because uh, saying I'm sorry and doing that is part of, it helps me recognize that I'm a sinner and that I'm fallen and that I do everything I do by the grace of God and by nothing of myself and helps me convey that to the other person. Most of the time for me, somebody's not going to know Christ on the other side of that table. And so I have that opportunity to communicate the grace of God to them in the way I respond and ask for forgiveness. Um, and that, you know, that it, ha- it happens more. It can happen more to me in a, in a leading where if somebody doesn't get it or doesn't get up to speed as fast as I think they should on something, I get impatient with them. Oddly, I'm not, a, um, although I, you negotiate a lot, I'm an M&A, M&A lawyer, so you've got people on the other side, lawyers on the other side, but my particular area of law is not given to ranting and raving. You know, that would be unbecoming of somebody in the mergers and acquisition world, so I don't really get that much confrontation on the other side of the lawyers. I mean, occasionally, but that's not really... Conflict for me is more if I think somebody's not getting it on my team or on the board or the other shareholder, and that is where I really have to stop and remember that maybe I don't get it. And I think that's to Jeff's point that I'm getting a little stupider as I get older, and I need to remind myself of that. And I think that's a really important – and to say I'm sorry that I was wrong. Okay. Um, being in the customer service, being in the with customer, um, you get the irate customer, and then it's my job to have the customer say what's going on. Um, I made the mistake or said something to a customer I should have said, you know, um, to come to the shop, you know, make a long story short, not to go in detail, that I told her I would, if she didn't do something and she was in the wrong, that I would have arrested. Okay. Uh, so older lady, <laughs> big guy like me, uh, looking back at it, I, I would have ne- if anybody I would have never said that and, 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 and that's what happened you know and, and the lady tried to get me fired you know being with the company and that was 19 years you know uh, I uh, was suspended for uh, two days without pay uh, which is right long like I said uh, looking back at it, I would probably would have never said that but you know when your customers they were drawing after you want to stand your ground too but being a man you can't do that you got to be gracious. Hey, man, I'm just up this way. And that's what happened. Like I said, I would have never did. And thank God they didn't fire me. <laughs> no, so, no, so, no. Let's say you got to be gracious with them. All right? Well, Ricky, that, that leads well into the, the flip side question. I think sometimes sins of commission are easier to identify because we usually get our hands slapped when those things happen. It's more obvious. Sins of omission um, are, are just as serious, but they're, they're less obvious. And so, just asking you guys as a group, thinking through your life and career, had there been times where there was truth you needed to share with somebody that for fear of confrontation or fear of how it would be received, that you maybe backed away from that, that, you know, in retrospect, you know, you'd say, man, I should have taken that chance. If there's a conversation you need to have, have the conversation. Don't, whether it's working through something in marriage or with your children or in a situation where you're a leader in your church or where it's in your workplace, if something needs to be said, pray, work on it to make sure you approach it biblically, but you have to have the conversation. And I think that's um, the times I regret is when I've backed off for fear of offending someone or... Um, that's not, again, as I've said to you, that's not typically my worry, but it is, there are times when I've done that, and it uh, inevitably, um, <laughs> that when you, when you don't do it, I have a little saying that I use with my wife, and she knows that whenever I do this, it means I've, I've done this at work probably someplace. No good deed goes unpunished. Mm-hmm. And when you don't have that conversation that you needed to have, um, it usually comes back to you in a gift later in the form of some, something doesn't work out right. And, boy, if I'd have just been straight about that at the front end, I could have solved myself a lot of problems here. And so uh, that is something that I've learned is that when I face an issue, have, a conf- you know, have an issue with somebody, I just need to be direct. And it's just really important. And the Lord can use that. A man came to see me last week that, Four, four or five years ago now, I guess is the first time we met, and he came to see me. We had a conversation. I, I didn't know him very well, but I was very direct with him and um, in that communication and, and watching what God had done in his life and the friendship that we've established and seeing that. 
it can work out the right way. You have to do it in love. You have to be careful. But I think that I think you have to have the conversation. So I don't. I'm not. I'm not in the category of failing to have that very often. Mine, mine is more. I'm in the category. I'm sorry. That's. My, <laughs> I give more apologies. Unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I think two quick vignettes kind of highlight this issue for me. Um, I, I'm very fortunate. I don't have a lot of regrets in life, but this is one of them. Um, uh, when we lived uh, in Arkansas as an Air Force base there, uh, my wife and I be- became friends with a young couple in our church and uh, <clears throat> similar age. We did a lot of things together. And then uh, after about a year or so, we started noticing something in their relationship that I couldn't we couldn't put our finger on. And it just seemed weird. And my wife and I had several conversations about, well, should we say something? Should, you know, particularly, Jeff, should you say something to the husband here? And, um, uh, you know, I just kind of, I, I knew in the back of my mind, I, I, I really honestly disobeyed the Holy Spirit. I just didn't because I, I didn't want to do the confrontation because they were one of the only young couples in our area and whatnot. Um, and uh, so I just made the decision not to say anything. About six months later, um, it was revealed that uh, she was having an affair on him, and they split up and had a divorce. Now, I'm not saying that I could have prevented that, but um, it was one of those life lessons in which the Lord really chastised me to say, okay, if, if I speak to you to speak some truth to someone, you need to do it. Um, because, like you say, the collateral consequences can be. And I'm not saying I would have been the one to save the marriage or anything, up, but I, I just it was very clear. That's the first one. Fast forward here within the last uh, six weeks. Uh, Unfortunately, um, my my tendency is to avoid these types of things. So much so that oftentimes I don't see that the conversation needs to be had. Because I'm not that perceptive. Um, But thankfully the Lord has shown me that. So I try to put people around me that shore up my weaknesses. And uh, I have a, a chief of staff who is very perceptive in these areas and is probably more like Todd, um, very very direct and um, uh, may even to the point to where he might even be considered the hammer in our organization. Um, and, and Larry knows who I'm, I'm talking about over there and shaking his head, yeah, that's probably right. Um, but the thing about that is that uh, I, I've given this gentleman permission to say, hey, listen, I know this is a weak area of me. I don't see, I'm not unwilling to have the conversation, but I might not see that it needs to take place. Um, and so he's come to me several times saying, you, you need to bring so-and-so in and talk to him about this issue. And here's why. Uh, and I'm even reluctant at that point, but I guess the point is that uh, sometimes we, you have blind spots. And that's, that's a blind spot for me, is being able to recognize when that conversation needs to take place and with whom. And so um, I try to recognize that and bring somebody into my circle of influence to say, pull me aside and say, okay, you need to talk to so-and-so for these reasons. Uh, so. Um, being that uh, I'm a customer service uh, manager, I, I I connect with my customers. Their share of their life, kids, and everything. And, uh, I regret uh, not telling this lady she's going through her, um, a husband trying to leave her, and she's a she's a Christian, and she don't want her divorce. But you know, it's and I told her I would keep praying for her, but I re- regret telling her, you know, that uh, it looks like he's not going to come back. But you know, like I said. She wants to stay in the relationship. He's doing his own thing. Uh, but at this point, I don't know what to tell her. Uh, so, But I'm looking for the advice from friends of people so that I can communicate with tell her what to do. But I, re- I, don't, I just don't know what to tell her. But still, uh, telling her the truth, I said, look like he's not coming back. He's doing his own thing. But that's something I'm trying to get some help with her so I can help her. Well, that's also a great kind of segue, I think, to this question. I think when we talk about truth, you know, with a, a capital T, we think about the desire that we have as men to be uh, witnesses in our workplace and, you know, sharing uh, with people uh, 
the news of, of the resurrection and the salvation that is available in Jesus. And so, with that as, a, as an active question in your workplace, how have you um, learned to share that truth with people in a way that uh, is, is gracious and, and at the same time is just aware of all the complications of sharing your faith at work and, and worry of legal issues or, or other things like that? What are some of the strategies you guys have developed uh, in order to be able to share that truth uh, with, with the people you work with? Okay. Um, yeah, I've spent probably the greater part of my adult life trying to answer that question. Um, and I've, I've come down to a couple things. One, um, peers, you know, I think with your peers, you just pray and ask God to give you opportunity and you can be as bold as as you can be with your peers. Um, and when you are at a, a lower level or maybe to the mid-level of an organization, you have a lot of peers. But as you move up in seniority, your, your peer group, with, particularly within the organization, gets smaller and smaller. Um, and with superiors and subordinates, those relationships are different because you have uh, commitments and, and fidelities to the organization, one of which is not to use your position to advance your own personal agenda, whatever that agenda is. Um, but then you've got the, the claim of the gospel and the, and the supremacy of Christ in your life to, to preach the gospel. So with the peers, I feel freedom. Uh, I don't do it that well, but you know, I, I share my faith and, and, and try to share my faith. Um, with subordinates, I look at that more in the sense of as a shepherd. Uh, I'm an elder at our church, and so I spend a lot of time thinking about shepherding, and you mentioned that. What what does love require in this individual's life right now? Um, not as much as, say, somebody in my church, just because the, the covenants and commitments aren't there. Um, but that seems to be a great need, uh, even with the folks that, that work for me is they desire to be shepherded. They desire to have someone that expresses interest in what they do. They, they desire to know that they bring value to the organization, um, that I'm concerned about their life, those types of things. Um, so we try to create a climate in which that type of shepherding can, can occur. And occasionally God opens the door uh, to share the gospel. Interesting thing, I have never had an individual... Uh, who has come into my office or I've gone to their office and they through a shared something very difficult that's going on in their life, which if you commit yourself to being a shepherd, people will begin to open up like that. I've never had someone when I say to them, w- would you mind, would it be OK if I just prayed for you right now in this situation? Never had. And, and these are run the whole spectrum of the religious world. Never had anybody say, no, don't. Um, and I respect that if they do. Uh, that has led to more opportunities to minister to people than probably any one thing um, that I've ever ever done. Um, and then the, on the kind of the organizational side, I just ask myself, okay, Lord, what does it look like to bring the gospel into this situation as the leader? Well, obviously your character plays a big part of that, just the way you conduct yourself day by day. Um, and do you give those folks that you know love Christ, do you give them the freedom and permission to love Christ in their workplace, or do you create an environment in which they're scared to do that? Um, and that, that we, could in, we could take an entire weekend to, to talk about all those, but those are just a couple initial thoughts that I have on that. I think it begins with living it out yourself in your own life um, and... And Jeff, I really could just say amen to everything Jeff just said because that's really the the heart of it is um, when you reach a, a certain levels of leadership, you are you're constrained in some ways in what you can say directly to a subordinate, um, but at the same exact time, you're not constrained to to live the love of Christ and to communicate. Um, I, I try very hard when something goes well to acknowledge by God's grace that this has happened. Um, I think some of my partners think I'm from Mars. Um, but that's okay. Um, I don't, when it goes well, 
it, it's never anything that I want to claim that I, I had anything to do with. I want to make sure that I'm reflecting glory to God in that and, and to Christ in that. And that's a personal choice. You know, I think you have to have your markers that help you remember. And one of the things that's been important for me to fight against my own pride, because I'm just so aware of that, that weakness in my life, is to make sure that I'm doing that. And, you know, when I've had the opportunity to engage more directly in opening God's Word with somebody in my office, it's usually sort of in a after hour setting where I know the, the dynamic of such that they've, they've asked and I've allowed me to enter into that. But um, mostly it's about making sure I'm breathing grace into this situation by my communication, making sure that I'm carrying myself in a way where it would be evident what is influencing my life as Christ. And it would be evident that um, as I engage situations in shepherding and seeking to move people along that um, I'm displaying a Christian character in doing that. Um, and then praying that the Lord might open an opportunity to speak to somebody. It's very challenging with um, in, a, in a subordinate situation to make sure that you're not in any way um, communicating in a way that's going to make you vulnerable to you know somebody who just wants to bring a legal attack on you. And so I, mm-hmm. I do think that's a hard challenge that we all face in the world that we live in today. But nothing stops me from being really clear about who I am and communicating in love to others and hoping and praying that there's a door that might open. And occasionally it does open, and when it opens, go through it. <laughs> you know, you can't miss those opportunities when they come. you got to walk right through it with the gospel and be clear. And so, um, At my job, uh, I'm, I, um, I don't know, I'm probably the only Christian, but trying to share the gospel with the, the guys, I have opportunities. Uh, one of the main questions, a couple of guys are, oh, why do you go to church? You know, that might give them the correct answer. You know, oh, what, what did the Bible say? You for the fellowship with other believers. Uh, and some of the guys, well, the church doesn't want your money. I said, tithing is very important. That's between you and God. God. You know, if you want to get your tithe, uh, tithe. Um, other things, the question, you know, like uh, the guys say, well, you know, People are looking for a thing, you know, looking for why to believe in God. And so being a Christian, you want to give them the right answer. I don't have all the answers, but I try to do it truthfully with the right answer. Um, you have all kinds of churches, you know, of the, some of the guys listen to the uh, TV advantage. I said, there's only one, there's 12, but I would recommend you. I said, Billy Graham, but others, you got to really search your heart. <laughs> if you want to let it. Uh, you know, Joel Olsen is real big. You know, a lot of people are searching for him and believe the stuff is that. Well, I said, listen to what Joel Olsen is preaching and look at the Bible. You know, that's that's not real uh, TV evangel. But like I said, it's hard. I connect with the customers well, well too. You know, I had an opportunity. One of the customers coming in uh, had a, going through a divorce. His wife left him. And, and you got to be careful because, you know, you get it sued. I said, can I pray for you? Like Jeff said, it was open. It wasn't an employee, it was a customer. And I prayed with him, you know, I hoping that his wife would come back. But stuff like that really is touching my heart, you know, sharing the gospel at work. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to reach some of my guys at my store. Um, Express all chains based on a Christian company. Integrity, you know. Um, but hopefully I can be able to share the gospel with guys at work. Amen. This time I'd love to open up the floor if you guys have some questions that you'd like to ask one or all of them. Steve? Yeah, today, especially with some of the younger generation, so much of the communication, Jeff, you mentioned sub 20% of the world, but now there's an electronic component of that, and I find a lot of times people are willing to be a little more aggressive and bold in that. Do you, have you, any of you struggled with that issue of having the Communicate through the electronic media, whether it's email or texting, or be careful about how you do that. If I can just repeat that question for the tape. Um, the the question is, how do you deal with different types of communication, electronic media that sometimes make people a bit more bold, uh, and and then even the legal ramifications of things like email and and the fact that all that is uh, kept as a record. I'm in the communication business. Um, I, I'm not a social media person. Um, I don't conduct anything really serious on text. And so when I write emails, 
Um, I, I'm really careful to make sure that the same things I've said to you about general communication, I try to make sure that my, my I treat an email like a letter and I write, I write it concise, kind of try to aim for the one screen of the BlackBerry. <laughs> for those of you who know what a BlackBerry is, <laughs> uh, you got to get it, you got to be, <laughs> uh, you got to be, got to be concise. But, but I, I, I think gracious, clear communication, even when you're responding to somebody who's harsh is really important and not, not getting yourself uh, electronic communications. I have a whole wing of our building full of people who go back and search your emails for use in lawsuits, and I've watched enough of that over the years to know that nothing ever, ever, ever goes away that you put in print, no matter if you think it goes away or not, it doesn't. And I think that's a, if you're really aware that it's never, ever leaving, that's a good reminder to be careful in what you communicate. It's never going away, ever. And that's a, um, a very important to remember. Yeah. Um. We are in the department right now. We're just now stepping gingerly into the world of social media. Um, I have a Twitter account. Okay. Um, I have a, a young lady who just graduated from college who sends me emails. Commissioner Dunn, tweet this, and uh, and she's bad at hitting all that budget. Budget. Um, things like that. But with respect to the context of this conversation, um, you know, when, when I talk to folks in the department, we talk about leadership. You know, I talk about the electronic media and all that. It's it's great for exchanging information, but I hesitate to call it communication. And and we try to draw that distinction. You know, I'm fine sending facts and figures and you know those types of things uh, via electronic communication. But when you're talking about making decisions that affect people's lives, um, I much prefer to do that face to face. Because, like I said, I need to be able to see the 80 percent of the communication that's going on that is not verbal. Um, I think that's true for the gospel as well. Um, uh, I know there are there are ministries that are doing great things through social media and whatnot in the proclamation of the gospel. Um, but that's not where I, that's not my job. And so I actually separate those two. Uh, one is a tool for information. Communicating the gospel is, is more of a life on life experience and, and uh, probably better in a face to face environment. I really don't deal that much with the uh, communication of social media. Uh, but, you know, my company you know, is like if you have a Facebook account, you have to be careful where you post on because we have had guys post stuff and they have got terminated. So mm-hmm. that's the communication with the uh, social media part with my company. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We got time for another question, yeah, Brian. Could you please speak to how you deal with the person that you're leading that's on your team that's having a performance issue? So you have an issue where you have a set criteria of expectations that you're thinking. Are you expecting them to fulfill, and you're consistently having, excuse me, you're consistently having an issue with that? You know, you're wanting ten widgets a day, they're producing six or seven consistently. How do you handle that from a grace-filled and truth-filled perspective? Uh, so the question is, how do you handle performance reviews, particularly substandard performance reviews? I do that with my employees. I basically train the new hood techs who do the all chains up top side. Uh, we basically try to do all chains in 10 minutes. I have one guy who's averaging 16 minute all chains. Uh, that's not good. Um, Cuts are in to in and out. Uh, that's why it's convenient to express all chain turns it in. Uh, in order to do I put them to the side. Yes, sir. I said, you need to get your bait time. He's new, but still, in order to do it in grace, uh, do it, do it with love. Uh, you know, don't be stern, but you know, in order to get it done, you know, this is what I do. Lead by example. So this is what I do. This is how my bait time is under 16 minutes. Uh, but like I said, do it with love. And uh, usually, like, I'm gonna wait about two weeks and see how it's done because 16 minutes is, t- is too high. But we're trying to get his bait time at least to 12 minutes, uh, and we'll see how it goes. Um. Yeah, I think it. Part of this depends on where you are in the organization. Um, earlier in my career, when I was just learning and supervising folks, uh, the the standards were very clear and they were very measurable. Uh, you know, you mentioned widgets. You know, you could tell if if you're producing five widgets day after day and you need to do ten. Okay, that's a pretty objective standard, and you can address that. 
the, the higher I've gone up, the, the more difficult that has become because the more senior you are in an organization, yeah, you have objective production goals or whatever, but a lot of your contribution to the organization is just through leadership, casting vision, setting priorities, those types of things, particularly in the public sector. Um, and so uh, I, I've actually found that to be uh, a challenge because you find yourself making decisions that ha- has this person is what I'm asking of this person within their skill set. And, and you have to evaluate objectively to the best extent you can. Can this person continue at this level? And I'm speaking more of a higher level uh, in order to carry out the vision that you have. Um, and uh, and so I think if, if once you answer that question, then that helps. If you think they can, then you invest resources to shore up where you see their their challenges are. But if you come to the conclusion that they can't, then you've got to go down a road of finding, number one, is there another place in the organization where they can bring value? And then how do you graciously transition to that with respect to, uh, or if there's not, how do you communicate that to them? And you, in, in this case, you just have to be direct, uh, do your homework. Um, and, and sometimes it just frankly calls for a very difficult decision. Um, but I, I think that the uh, undergirds all of that, and, and I talk to our folks a lot about this, is that the number one goal has got to be, particularly at the senior level, what's best for the organization? And that's why we're here. What's best for the organization. Um, and that's the foundation upon which we, we kind of move forward. I don't know if that helps you, but I, I found that the more senior levels, that type, navigating through those type things can be more challenging. I'm a continuous feedback uh, type of um, manager. And so with that, if I can use that term. And so I, um, when I do performance reviews, um, I, I sit down after each project, after each major initiative, and talk with the people involved. Um, I try to give direct feedback. Uh, If I'm doing a written performance review, let me help all of your lawyers and just give you this advice. Don't put down great whenever they're not great because you've only made your whole organization and your future challenge really hard. Um, you need to be clear, and if you don't know how to write the words clearly, talk to your, you know, talk to your human resources folks, talk to your lawyers to get it right. But, um, but I believe you have to be direct in communication with an employee so that you can tell them where they are. Um, I work in teams. Everything I do in my life, I try to work in teams because I need people around me to short my weaknesses, as Jeff said, and. Um, and I've the most successful review situations I've had have been where I've been able to look at somebody and say, you're failing terribly at this. Um, if we could rearrange your world like this, uh, perhaps this would be a better fit. And in both situations, I can recall one was two years ago, I had that conversation. That employee just said to me recently, you know, this has been the best two years. I, they were in a place where their gifts were really being able to bloom, and the conflict was sort of down because they were out of a spot where they clearly weren't going to be gifted to work in this area, but they were really gifted here. Trying to discern that. it's I, Whenever you have a failure with an employee, you have to be willing to acknowledge as a leader that or – uh, that, you know, this could be on you. You could be either failing to lead wrong. You could be um, not giving them clear direction. And you got to get a hard look in the mirror at yourself before you walk in to give that feedback because it's oftentimes been, I missed it. I didn't see something. I gave them work that didn't fit their gift mix. I can fail really easily if you give me the wrong kind of work to do. I can turn myself into a complete failure. Uh, and I think that's what you have to be self-aware is you've got to make sure that the assignment and the position fits the person. And if they don't, be willing to move it around. Sometimes, you know, last week I had to sit down with somebody and push them pretty hard to say, you're missing something completely here. And that person didn't love that feedback from me, but they acted on the feedback. And then I could come back and say, I'm so proud of them. I'm so encouraged. I was so great, you know, to affirm that. And so it's a balance, but you've got to be willing to give the hard, direct feedback and don't shirk it. Um, but make sure you understand if you've got failings in this, own it. Mm-hmm. 
you know, own it carefully with your HR counsel, depending on the situation, but, but own the problem in the employee review so that you're giving it clear feedback. But don't just assume it's all their fault if they're failing. You, you may not be such a great leader yourself, and you may need to take a look in the mirror on that one before you, you – know, that's an important part of it. Great questions, guys. Um, just one thing, we're, we are uh, finished. The, the first thing I want to say is you guys all have this on the uh, table in front of you. This is our third panel or our, our third event this summer is going to be Tuesday, August 8th. We'd love for you to come back for the third summer series event. See our panelists there, Leroy Abrahams, um, or Abrams from uh, North Central Alabama area. He's the president of Regions here. Uh, Jay Dixon, the Managing Director of Northwestern Mutual Hoover, and Blake Stevens, uh, who's the Director of People and Culture at Owning Group. We'd love for you guys to come back for that. We're so glad you joined us this morning. Would you uh, join me in thanking our panel this morning?